Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mindes and welcome to Mom's Favorites, Books My Mother Loved. Um, so this next book is another book that's in a series. Um, this is also a book of historical fiction. And uh, this is one of the kinds of books that my mother liked, not just because my mother really, really liked historical fiction, because she did, um, but also the fact that it was a very big book. My mother loved really, really big books. And it wasn't, you know, if you asked her, well, do you like books that are big as opposed to books that are small? No, I mean, it just it had to do with the fact that the books that she liked tended to be tended to be really, really big books, hefty books. Um, that's actually the reason why there have been six videos rather than the usual uh, three to four videos of late is because this one took me a while. Uh, because Colleen McCullough's The First Man in Rome, which is the first book in a series, is a really big book. And I should admit, for the sake of, uh, you know, admissions, that I have not read every page in this book because a significant portion of it, the last, I would say, 150 pages, are actually a very lengthy, very completist uh, glossary of terms. Because this is a work of historical fiction, and it's historical fiction from a particularly distant period. Um, you know, it's we're talking about a time that is more than 2,000 years ago. We're talking about the Rome just prior to Julius Caesar, because this is a series that kind of tells the story of where the Julius Caesar we all know from Shakespeare came from, how he came to be who he was, and uh, you know, goes up to the end where he was assassinated. The thing is that this is a book that is about setting the stage. This is a book that sets up the Rome into which the Julius Caesar we all know sort of entered. Uh, because, you know, we know about Caesar, we know about Veni Vidi Vici, we know about, you know, his various successes, the concerns people had about him trying to become emperor of Rome, and all that kind of stuff. But this is a book that takes place before that, in the antecedents, with the kind of, the people who kind of had to do with building up that, that Roman fear of, of there being an emperor. The, the star of this book, then there are sort of two two men who are kind of the the center point where, where this book rests. It's not that there aren't other characters, and it isn't that we don't hear from those other characters, but uh, the two people that we hear from most, uh, Gaius Marius and, uh, and uh, Sulla, who's... Uh, full proper name I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head because I never remember anybody's name, um, that these are the two men who kind of uh, bring the book all the way through. The book starts with a Caesar, a Gaius Caesar, um, but the thing about... Uh, the, the thing about uh, Gaius Julius Caesar... Um, is that uh, he's kind of just there for the first little bit in terms of setting up sort of where the Caesar family comes from and where uh, and and uh, where Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla sort of they they marry into the Caesar family and. These two and these two men are the driving force of this, and so Gaius Marius, who really, in a way, is in a lot of ways, you can see him as the protagonist of this novel, uh, because everything in this novel kind of circles 
around him and circles around back to him because Sulla is, uh, you know, he winds up marrying the younger of the two Caesar sisters and uh, Gaius Marius winds up uh, marrying the elder of the, of the two sisters. And so, you know, they're kind of brothers-in-law um, in, in a way. But the thing is that what you have is that, that Solo winds up sort of becoming a client and then an assistant and a right-hand man to Gaius Marius... And so all of his, so all of the stuff about Solo's perspective, about what he does, how he does the really kind of awful things that he does to get where he, to get where he ends up, um, they kind of all hook right back into the Gaius Marius story. And Marius is uh, from outside of Rome and he's sort of a minor, like a squire sort of family, you know. They're, they're technically nobility, but nobody who's like proper nobility actually really cares about them. Um, but the big thing for him is that he's from outside of Rome, because Rome is, it's really very much an entity unto itself. Romans really feel that anybody from outside Rome is other and most significantly lesser. Uh, you know, you can pick your own particular metaphor for this. If you live in England, you think of Londoners. If you live in Canada, you think of people from Toronto. If you live in, uh, in the U.S., you think of New York. That there's, there's, at least think of the perception others have of these places. This perception that everybody who lives there thinks of themselves as somehow better than everyone else. Um, this is, by the way, of course, not true in a lot of cases. But let's be honest, it is, of course, true. It is uh, true just enough of the time to ruin it for everyone else. Uh, so, but the people in Rome, they're, they've effectively gotten control. They have their so-called republic, that which is going to be called an empire in, you know, the near future of the book, um, they've taken over a part of, a relatively small part, but nonetheless a part of northern Africa. They've spread all over the Middle East, and of course they have taken over the Italian peninsula, and they sort of see themselves as we are Rome, and then you have the Italians who are kind of they're allied, they're sort of related to us, they're not as good as us. And the point is that Marius is Italian, he's not Roman, he wasn't born in Rome, he's not seen as Roman. And so even though he technically has the right, it's very, very hard for him in the Roman Senate to try to make a name for himself, to try to progress in public life. And he winds up doing so... Um, after a series of really awful, awful misadventures and and bunglings of of Romans of Rome's military, because Marius is a military man and he loves the military and he loves being in the military and he loves being a soldier and he's a great, great general and and he winds up sort of making his career by being a general. And sort of, you know, but people keep on bungling up and he keeps on taking advantage of their bungling to say, here, give me some more power or give me, you know, a reissue of power because you need to elect me again because I need to be here because otherwise you're going to send another substandard general. And so this whole book is about this push-pull between the Roman... Senate, which doesn't want an outsider and doesn't want the risk of somebody trying to basically make himself king, with Marius, who doesn't really want to be king, but he wants he wants his props. He wants to be accepted, and he wants to have the power that he feels is his due, or rather the elections, but he wants to get it sort of 
you know, not by rabble rousing, but by being duly elected. But at the same time, there's a push-pull between the people of Rome and the people of Italy and the lower classes who are really, really sick of these upper classes stomping around and acting like they're somehow better than everyone else because, of course, you have the layers of Rome is better than the rest of Italy and inside of Rome, all of us rich people with names that we can, you know, trace all the way back to supposedly the beginnings of Rome, well, we're better than everybody else in Rome. And this title has to do with somebody who's basically managed to achieve a position that is a uh, that isn't technically, you know, uh, some sort of real official title, but it's something that you kind of get out of successfully being a consul and successfully working your way to the top of the political heap. And Sulla is a man who is willing to commit murder to get what he wants, but at the same time, he's drawn in this as a really, really sympathetic character. You know, he's drawn as somebody who's maybe been raised in such a way and pushed in such a way and twisted in particular ways that he's willing to commit these murders, but at the same time, he really does read as very, very sympathetic, at least in this book. Um... Which is no doubt very, very interesting for those who know enough history, uh, because if you look in the afterword of this book, um, one of the things that Ms. McCullough says uh, has to do with um, her bringing up the uh, the questions of. of uh, uh, why, whether or not people, you know, why Gar Gaius, why she depicted Gaius Marius as getting along so well with Sulla. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting, of course, that uh, she clearly did a lot of research because she says that if she had attached a glossary, it would have been absolutely enormous, and that if you want to write to her publisher, they will mail you her glossary, uh, which uh, does suggest, of course, that this is, um, shall we say, something of a very, very hefty matter of research. And indeed, this is a book that is, you know, about close to 900 pages long, and... And and this glossary starts on page seven hundred and eighty-five. It's it's just a remarkably hefty uh, item of of research and and explaining all and explaining all of these various terms that that people may not know. And so it's. It's a really, really solid piece of historical fiction in terms of research, in terms of depicting people, but at the same time depicting people as being people. Because, of course, it's, it's one of those problems that you get sometimes when reading historical fiction, is that the authors get so caught up in writing in the idiom of the time and all kinds of other things that they lose track of the fact that humans are still humans, and just because you've set up a different political system doesn't mean you're not going to still have all of those same back-and-forth issues. Um, and the one thing I will say about this, and the reason I'm not going to read any more of this series, is that this book has a happy ending. And I'm stopping here, because I know where the story of Julius Caesar goes. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not going to be reading any more of this. But, uh, yeah, I can see why this was my mother's favorite. It's long, and it's complicated, and it's hefty, and it's intellectual. And, yeah, that, that, was, that was my mom. So, that's all I'm going to say about this. And I will see you all next week.